In today's video, what I want to do is start talking about developing situational awareness. So I guess the first thing we need to do is come up with a definition. Now, I have the privilege of living here in Massachusetts, and I've got a great trainer, Ken Condon, that I've been able to take a bunch of classes from, and he defines situational awareness like this. Someone with situational awareness is able to see the big picture and accurately evaluate likely outcomes. So, all right, well, that makes sense, but let's see if we can come up with an even more detailed explanation. So I found this one online from BlackBerry Security. They say, situational awareness is the ability to perceive, understand, and effectively respond to one's situation. It involves comprehending a given circumstance, gathering relevant information, analyzing it, and making informed decisions to successfully address any potential risks, hazards, or events that might occur. So now we know what situational awareness is. Well, how does that apply to motorcycling? Well, I remember when I was taking my MSF class to get my license here in Massachusetts, and I hadn't been riding for a little over 20 years, so I was returning to motorcycling. And I remember them talking about situational awareness and riding through traffic and analyzing the traffic patterns and coming up with potential escape routes as you see all of these dangers around you. And I thought to myself, hmm, here I am, I haven't ridden in 20 years, I barely remember how to work the controls, and the guys around me, a lot of them were worse off than me. They had no experience at all with riding bikes, and now we're supposed to analyze and come up with escape plans. I mean, really? Now, before we continue, let me make it clear that I don't consider myself to be an expert on this topic. I'm just like most of you out there. Right? When I need to know something, when I need to learn something about motorcycling, about things like situational awareness, then I go to the people that are experts. People like Ken Condon, people like David L. Huff, people like Eric Tro. I go and I read what they've said uh, about this topic, and then I take that information and I try to come up with a plan that works for me. So that's what I'm gonna share here, is I'm gonna share the things that I've learned from them and that I've implemented into my writing style. Now, of course, developing situational awareness on a motorcycle does mean that you need to have some experience. right? You need to go out there and run into all of the potential hazards that we find on a daily basis, people pulling out in front of us, people stopping short, you know, all kinds of things like that. And then you need to survive those things, right? And then learn, learn how to recognize them in the future. And while that's great for we guys who've now been riding for nearly 20 years since I returned, well, it doesn't help new riders very much or the guy like me, right, nearly 20 years ago, who was returning to motorcycling. So I think there is a strategy that we can employ, right, that will help us to develop that situational awareness and again, hopefully keep us safer. It has been said that to ride a motorcycle effectively, you need to become good at multitasking. And while that sounds like a good idea, the truth is that we humans are really bad at focusing on more than one thing at a time. Yes, physically, we can learn how to walk and chew gum or work the clutch and brake at the same time, but mentally, Rather than thinking about multiple things at once, what we do is actually switch very quickly between more than one task or points of focus. Even now, 18 years after I returned to riding, I still cannot ride through an intersection and come up with plans for every possible situation. Trying to do would require me to take focus away from more immediate concerns, like the guy getting on his brakes in front of me. Now, I had a motorcycle accident back when I was younger, right? and those of us who have been involved in such instances know that things happen really quickly. 
you have maybe a fraction of a second or at the most a few seconds in order to react. David L. Huff in his book Mastering the Ride told us that the Hurt Report found that about 93% of riders who had accidents had four seconds or less to respond from the time they identified a threat to the time of impact. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have four seconds from the time I identify a threat, I can probably bring my bike under control to avoid that accident. But if it gets down to one or two seconds, well, that's gonna get to be a lot harder. Right, so for me, the key to being able to avoid accidents right, is giving yourself more time to react. When I have time to react, it is up to the skills that I have learned. Have I practiced emergency braking and swerving? If I have, then my body will know what to do without thinking. Again, you have but a few seconds to avoid a collision, so there is no time to make plans, there is only time to react. In martial arts, this is called mu shin, or mind of no mind, reacting without thinking. That is why we drill the basics over and over again, and that is why practice is so important. As I mentioned, being able to react is largely determined on the time between initial identification of a threat and, in the case of a motorcycle accident, the actual collision, which is less than four seconds. The more time I can give myself, the more likely I am to avoid impacting an encroaching car or other object. So here's the question then. How do we go about giving ourselves more time to identify the threats and react? For the rest of this discussion, let's assume that we are trying to negotiate an intersection, which is of course the most dangerous place for we motorcyclists. The first thing to think about, in my opinion, is following distance. The larger space we can create for ourselves from the car in front of us, the better. Ideally, allowing a four-second gap is the goal, but at a minimum, I shoot for two, which, in most traffic situations, is more realistic. So we can't have this discussion on negotiating an intersection without talking about speed. Right, we know that the faster you go, well, the less time you're going to have to react. So making sure that you're riding through the intersection at an appropriate speed for the conditions is essential. Not only does a greater following distance provide more reaction time, but it also allows us to open up our vision. If we are following closely, we are forced to focus only on the car directly in front of us. Pulling back allows us not only to see the vehicles we are trailing, but also potential dangers on either side of the road. Having more distance allows us to scan from side to side and identify cars entering the roadway from side streets, driveways, and parking lots. I mean, this is just common sense. If you are too close, your focus is on what is in front of your face. Pull back to open up your field of vision. Along with opening up or widening your field of vision, increasing your following distance also allows you to extend your vision. Having a greater following distance is going to allow you to look up the road farther. And this is something that, again, David Huff says is essential in developing situational awareness. And you can read about that in his book, Mastering the Ride. Another thing that is often mentioned when developing situational awareness is to put your head on a swivel. And whenever I hear this, it kind of reminds me of one of those bobbleheads that are constantly moving. You know, you're doing this all of the time. And that's not really what you want to do. Right? Really what you want to do is have a nice, slow, and deliberate scan across the intersection to identify those different problems. So rather than a swivel, again, I would call it slow scan. Things you'd be looking for is, is there someone making a left turn in front of you? Are there cars parked on the side of the street that may back out into the street? Is there an intersecting road, driveway, or parking lot that you have to look for cars coming out of? Is the guy in front of you on the phone or doing something other than paying attention to the road? Again, you're looking for all of these things as you're traveling. And I'm going to emphasize once more that in order to be able to do this, you need to have a greater following distance. Give yourself space so that you can scan and see all of these things. If you're too close to that car in front of you, well, you're only going to be able to look at the back of that car. 
So once you've identified those potential dangers and something happens, then what do you do? Get on your brakes and swerve? Well, yes, if you have to, but ideally what you want to do is identify those dangers far enough in advance so you can make smaller corrections. Things just like getting off the throttle, getting on a little bit of brake, right? Things like changing lane position. Here's one thing that happens a lot here in Massachusetts. We'll have people that uh, are parked on the side of the road. We have tight two lane roads around here. So we'll have a delivery truck over there, or we'll have a utility company, something like that. And then the people coming in the opposite direction, well, they want to get around that truck, so they swing out into your lane, right? Even though they shouldn't, right? They should wait for you to pass, but they do it anyway. So as a motorcycle rider, I can insist that I have the right of way and I can barrel straight ahead and probably get hit, or I can move my bike easily over to the right-hand side of the road and let people pass, right? That's the best way to handle it. All right, same thing with people pulling out from a side street. They do that all of the time, right? I can either again barrel straight ahead on the gas, insisting that I have the right of way, or I can identify that problem again, get off the gas, brake, let that person come out and get into the roadway, right? It's the easier way to do it, it's what's going to keep you safe. So now by this time, I know I'm beating a dead horse and I guess you guys get the idea, right? In order to give yourself more time to react, you need to increase that following distance and watch your speed, All right? That's what's gonna give you more time, again, to keep yourself safe. At 30 miles per hour, you cover 44 feet per second. At 50 miles per hour, 73 feet. And at 70 miles per hour, 102 feet per second. While stopping distance depends on the vehicle and, of course, your rider or driver skill level, on average it takes about 87 feet to stop from 30 miles an hour, at 50 miles an hour about 200 feet, and at 70 miles an hour 337 feet. So the bottom line here is once again, give yourself that time to identify problems and react to them. All right guys, ride safe. Keep squeezing your lemon.